All right, and we are live. I'm with Matt a center from of uh, Lolly. Matt, really happy to be here today. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited uh, about this conversation. Maybe just to call out the pink elephant. Uh, this is our first time actually, you know, meeting probably face to face, virtually, whatever you want to call it, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, so I guess the, the 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 first kind of main question I'd like to start with is really just to learn about people's story, um, in terms of you know before coming into Bitcoin, and then also how you know the learning of Bitcoin has maybe impacted the trajectory of your your career path or your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. So um, let's see. I first uh, Bitcoin was brought to me first. This was years ago, like. Um, Gosh, I, it was during my first startup we were starting uh, and I was in Minneapolis on Target's campus at the time. We, we were integrating Target into our universal shopping cart. And um, one of my contractors there had brought to me this idea of Bitcoin. He was just like super into it. He was like, you've got to get into this. This is so awesome. And I kept asking him questions because I didn't really understand it. And he kept explaining to me, he's like, no, 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 that's taken care of. And then Long story short, uh, I was in the middle of that startup. It was not Bitcoin related, uh, so ended up not actually getting into it um, until uh, around the time after I sold that startup. And then my co-founder, Alex Edelman, and I started just playing with some other stuff. And we had independently started playing with cryptocurrencies. And um, he was looking mostly at Bitcoin. I was actually playing around with Ethereum and smart contracts. And then well, decided- what, 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 Matt, Matt, what year are we in? By the way, is it Max or Matt? Sorry. Matt, you prefer Matt. Max? Matt. Oh, Matt. Matt. Okay, Matt. Matt. That's right. I just saw Max in your. Uh, in your oh, name. sorry. My son was using this for his Zoom meeting. That's my son, Max. Yeah. Gotcha. 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 Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah, Matt. So I was gonna ask you what, what, what. First of all, what was the nature of that startup? Was it similar to Lolly, but not Bitcoin? So really? that first startup was or... called Cosmic Cart, and it was a universal shopping cart slash um, uh, enterprise commerce gateway, whatever you want to call it. It, it powered buy buttons. So the ability to buy anything anywhere that you see it. Um, so, you know, you'd see a target product on ShopStyle and then you could buy it uh, right there through ShopStyle site. And so we powered all those pipes behind the scene to connect the retailers and the, um, ad or the uh, publishers. Um, so that was, that was more of a, um, an e-commerce kind of thing. Uh, but still in that same vein with Lolly, you know, we've got this um, retail space that we're in. It's still an e-commerce space, but we're in a different part of it. We're on the consumer side of it at this point. We're not powering, you know, B2B, um, which is actually a lot more fun in my opinion. I, I really like doing the consumer stuff much better. Um, the enterprise stuff is very good for like, um, you know, honing your technical chops and things like that. I mean, not that we don't use them in the consumer side too, but it's just more fun interacting with the community and um, seeing the people that are actually using your product uh, from the front end to the back. and. Um, Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't even know. But let, 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 I guess just, let, let's just to go back to the Bitcoin thing, though. Uh, so when when your co-founder, and by the way, before we even get into that, what was your role at that previous? Like, CTO. Were you more like the business guy? The no, CTO, guy? Yeah. CTO. So Alex, okay. uh, Alex was CEO. He was the um, business co-founder and I was the technical co-founder. We had a third designer co-founder, uh, Pearson Cunningham, as well. Um, so Alex and I actually started Lolly together again uh, for our second attempt. And um, same roles, he's CEO, I'm CTO. Um, and we, Pearson's on again as our designer as well. So um, yeah, we actually just got a lot of the team back together. We've got Jared Giles, he's my VP of engineering uh, at Lolly. He worked on Cosmic for the longest time. Um, we've had some other uh, contractors with us that worked with Cosmic. Uh, we've got Shana Jordan, who we met when we went to ShopStyle. Um, so she, uh, she runs our ops. She's um, head of ops or director of ops. I forget what our titles are, but um, yeah, so she makes the business run and we all uh, do what she says. <laughs> Cool, cool. And then, and then, and then you mentioned the story about like how your was it your co-founder who brought Bitcoin to you? So do do you kind of know what his no. aha moment was, and or was it your yeah, friend? Yes, so you my was friend it? back, uh, or my he was a contractor for us for Cosmic back. Um, gosh, that would have been 2013, I think, when he was super excited about mm. it. And then I didn't have time for it. Um, and then fast forward to around 2016, um, after we sold uh, Cosmic Cart. Uh, and we had some free time at that point. So uh, I was playing around with uh, Ethereum smart contracts and Bitcoin and Alex was playing around with Bitcoin and we were trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to use these new technologies. And um, it wasn't really until I started reading um, 
uh, books and some other, you know, just kind of uh, deep dives into what Bitcoin actually was that I really jumped fully on the Bitcoin team. Um, Cause I was, I was actually trying to do something with healthcare on Ethereum contracts and um, long-term maybe it would have worked. It just wasn't, I, I couldn't see a, a path to monetization or anything. And then um, Alex came back with this uh, shopping rewards idea because it seemed like an easy way to get people uh, involved in Bitcoin that hadn't yet. And, you know, it made sense coming from our background in, in e-commerce and retail. And we had all these uh, retail partnerships from, or friendships from, uh, Cosmic Cart. So we just went back to all of them and said, hey, this is what we're doing now. And so that really helps with our uh, business development. Um, and Shana too. Shana brings a lot of her contacts and her expertise from running uh, business development for ShopStyle and um, getting a lot of these retailers on board with us, having these direct contracts with them and um, just, you know, easy for them to get into Bitcoin because they just proxy through us, right? They, we turn the, uh, cash rewards into Bitcoin on their behalf. So the retailer doesn't really have to do anything. The consumer on the other side, they're just shopping like they normally do. And then they get Bitcoin uh, instead of cash or they can cash out to, to dollars if they want to. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just all kind of made sense. It was an easier path to monetization. Um, so I abandoned that idea with uh, my healthcare idea and just jumped onto um, uh, the lolly bandwagon with Alex again for, for our second startup together. And then, and, and what was it about? I mean, that's kind of a big uh, decision, right? To to be like, well, we're gonna we're gonna dedicate all of our time and resources and you know reputation and everything into this new kind of you know almost uh, at that time you said 2017 is when you guys made the leap in. So I'm just curious, what was your thinking around? Yeah. Uh, so you said you played with Ethereum. I'm actually originally from Toronto, so kind of got to see like the birth of Ethereum and and its emergence. Uh, and all that and, and maybe we can get into that a bit later but but we're really curious about like bitcoin though like what made you guys be like okay well it's important for us to get people into bitcoin because that that in itself seems like a bit of a leap of faith yeah i mean it is but then so at first you, you're kind of just playing around with it right but then there's there's i think there's a point where it just clicks and you're like oh my gosh this this needs to be everybody needs to do this like this this needs to be for everybody because you know there is once, once you learn about, you know, you go from, you, you become like this armchair economist and then you dive deeper and you learn more about it. And then you learn more about you know, like what makes sound money and what is money and long-term, what will be the best type of money for a, a thriving society. And then you start looking at, I mean, I don't want to go too far into the conspiracy theory, uh, ultra libertarian, you know, overthrow the government type stuff, but there is a part of me that's very, um, uh, doesn't like authority so much. So I, I do like to disrupt things and, you know, uh, the ability to uh, step around uh, fiat money and, you know, government uh, decreed uh, value um, really appealed to me as well. So. Um, so by the way, I don't know if you, uh, if you kind of know the, I know this is like our first time really chatting, but we had a, a situation in India, if you will, a couple years ago where the central bank literally tried to not allow yeah. uh, Bitcoin businesses to operate. So, um, uh, so, but I'm just curious, uh, one of the, one of the, um, you know, kind of criticisms uh, around Bitcoin is, well, you know, you're, you, they're never going to allow it. They allow it. I think Ray Dalio recently, even last week, right, said said the exact same thing. So, so what? Uh, I mean, it's hard to say what hasn't Ray thought of yet because he's a pretty smart guy. But, but what? Uh, but what are people missing? Well, like I mean, why? Why isn't how, it going to be shut down? What was your thought on it? How do you not allow it? I, how, how does anyone come in and stop it? I mean, look where it's at already. You know, it's only been a decade and it's show, showing no signs of slowing down. We've got institutions jumping in. We've got, you know, even the dinosaurs like PayPal jumping in, you know, everybody's kind of seeing this as like, oh crap, we've got to have a piece of this. You know, this is, this is something that is not going to go away. And I think you're just seeing that buy-in just starting really, you've got the billionaires jumping in. And I, I think the, the ones that are saying they're never going to allow it are either just sad they didn't get in early enough or are still kind of positioning themselves for at what point in the near future they're going to get in because i don't know i don't think it's i mean it, it's it's a you know distributed system that just doesn't you know sort of a, an emp that takes out all electricity on the planet it's it's very very difficult to stop something like bitcoin 
Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I agree with you. I think technically speaking, especially if they've got these things going up in satellites and, you know, people's basements, uh, you know, I mean, if broadcasting it over radio. Yeah. So so good luck with, I guess, technically trying to take it down. But, uh, but what if what if they try and do and again, I'm playing a bit of a devil's advocate, but what, what if they do what they did with gold? Right. Where, um, yeah, they couldn't right. shut gold down, but they did confiscate it. it. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. I mean, again how do you do that where do you go to get people's bitcoin like how do you especially if you're one of those people that has memorized your seed phrase like how do you take that person's bitcoin and where where are they going to go get it how are you how are they going to make you come in and turn in your seed phrase it's just not going to happen i mean you can't even be coerced to do that right legally speaking you can't you can't be coerced to say things that you know that are private to you (sighs) ah Yeah. So, and by the way, in India, it did uh, it took took a couple of years, but, but all three judges did rule in in favor of uh, of you know of Bitcoin or whatever, and then did uh, deem the 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 note the by the RBI as unconstitutional. And so, so yeah, I think, and yeah. I mean, and I don't know a lot about the government of India, but I hear that's you, falls under free speech, in my opinion, of you know the ability to to do this. Um, how do you shut down a, a First Amendment right? I mean, I'm not, it's not to say that it isn't possible. Obviously anything's possible. Uh, it's not probable. And I can't imagine the uh, amount of effort it would take and the amount of money it would take to go and shut down everybody that's working with Bitcoin. Or, I mean, could you imagine like mass arrests of people using Bitcoin and under what pretense? It's like, I, I just can't, I can't imagine a scenario other than something super, super evil happening yeah. that just like changes the face of the planet or something. It's um, kind of a yeah. New York strike kind of um, probability. Yeah, it's insane, no? Like, I mean, how, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bitcoin is is kind of amazing that way. So cool. So so you guys discover this new digital asset, potentially the future of money. Um, and then you start thinking, okay, we've got to build some sort of business around it. Uh, just curious, you start tinkering with Ethereum. Any, any thought, are you still uh, fascinated by it? Are you turned off completely by it? Uh, where, where that spectrum are you? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh... I, I neither. I'm not on either. I, I try to I try to keep an open mind about everything and mm. avoid uh, any kind of uh, maximalism or any kind of ism. Really, I'm just not that kind of person. So, um, you know, I see uh, some of the value it has in uh, at, you know as the world's distributed computer. Um, I think it gets a little hairy when people start calling uh, ether money. Mm. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Um, I don't think it is as much as Bitcoin uh, per se, but that's not to say it doesn't have its use case on its own uh, technology. So, um, and, and I, I really haven't even touched it since uh, 2016, 17, when I was playing with it. So I, I don't even know where it's gone as far as like maturity. I know Ethereum 2 is, keeps getting postponed, but um, yeah, not, not a huge fan, but I don't really, I don't hate it like people do. It's, it's just hey, not how I am. Hey Matt, have you ever heard of um, RSK out of curiosity? Rootstock, no. they're kind of building mm-hmm. like solidity on top of Bitcoin. So it leverages Bitcoin's, I guess, inherent, you know, currency. Yep. Anyways, okay, so but I guess my, my deeper question is, is kind of getting the lolly is that, okay, so you guys start going, okay, well, there's this way to make money and increase adoption at, you know, at a, at a fast pace here. And we are uniquely positioned with our BD relationships and, and just kind of our position in the market to capitalize on this opportunity. There have been, I think, if I, I mean, I've been in this space for quite a while, but I'm trying to remember, there have been a few others that have maybe attempted to do things like you guys, but nothing at the kind of the level and the pace that you guys seem like you're executing at. Um, yeah. But 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 just curious, did you guys kind of take a look at that that and and try and figure out like, well, where were those mistakes and what could you maybe improve upon, or was it I mostly mean, just the relationships that you said before? You mean mistakes from our previous start? No, or? from the other attempts at doing similar things, because it's a brilliant idea, right? Like giving people rewards for Bitcoin as a form of rewards for shopping. But I'm just curious, like, what was your guys' approach as you guys settled on an MVP? Was it very straightforward? You just said, let's just do what we've similar to what we've done before. Was it was there a bit of a and the reason I'm asking this is because um, like one of my goals, Matt, is to inspire more people to build on top of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Right. And yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, so I think um, probably one of the reasons we did it the way we did, we didn't necessarily look at other, as far as I know, we were 
one of the first, if not the first, um, to come out with this. And that's not to say there weren't others that tried at the wrong time. I mean, timing is everything. But um, the the approach we took was not to look at the crypto side of things. We actually, because Ebates bought our last uh, startup, so we spent some time at Ebates. Uh, now Rackets and Rewards and um, you know, the, the model uh, is pretty simple as far as the business model goes. Um, and then just add the, the technical layer on top of that of converting cash to Bitcoin. And um, that we, we approached the design from a consumer standpoint, not from a let's, uh, let's build on Bitcoin, uh, if that makes any sense. So I, I guess what I mean by that is we looked at the state of Bitcoin apps um, or Bitcoin oriented apps and even Ethereum uh, dApps and just it was all horrible like there was no good user experience everybody's like excited about this technology but nobody's really building it in a way that was accessible to people who didn't understand it um, so that was actually the big thing we settled to solve is like how do we get this to our siblings and to our parents and our friends who aren't bitcoin savvy or crypto savvy um, and it was not looking at the Bitcoin side of things so much as building a product on the consumer side that just happened to convert rewards to Bitcoin on the back end. So I think that was the approach we took. We were very deliberate about that. Um, and we still are today, like when we release new features and stuff, we're, we're very mindful of the consumer aspect more so than the, because we get, you know, we'll get um, inbound requests for lightning support and such. And it's like, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. That's cool. There's not really a good use case for it uh, in what we're doing right now. Maybe there will be in the future, but just integrating lightning for the sake of having lightning support is not uh it's not something that benefits our average consumer uh because it's still a very um, unapproachable technology from the uh kind of the normie uh, viewpoint if you will so um like if i if i brought my uh brother in and said hey you know i'm adding lightning support to lolly okay what is that you know so <clears throat> Our goal was to get you know the 99% of people who aren't into crypto into crypto. Uh, it wasn't necessarily to uh, appease crypto uh, fanatics, which is that it's fine. We have both of those, and that's great. Um, so we get a little pressure from both ends sometimes, and uh, we try to you know triage things appropriately and do the cool stuff and is, 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 still keep the consumer. In so, mind. so Matt, walk me through the the process of like the mindset of someone coming to your service because on one side they're a normie, so to me that equates. Uh, that they don't even maybe know about Bitcoin, right? Uh, and then, and then there's uh, so so. I mean, like, so why would I want to sign up for a service that gives me Bitcoin as reward if I don't even know about it? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously we capitalize on these bull markets as much as possible with our marketing because um, you know once it's buzzing and booming and we're hitting nearly 20k, I don't even know what it's at right now, but I'm sure it's, we're still up there around 18. Um, these are the, the prime time to get people because everybody's hearing about it, right? It's on the news. It's on mainstream news. It's everybody's talking about Bitcoin. We got people that watch CNBC all the time. They're, it's on there regularly. So, uh, I mean, a lot of times people come to, they, they don't know what they've got. They don't know what they're getting. They just see that, you know, it, it's an easy story for us to tell because we'll say like, okay, you know, if you started, if you were an original user of Lolly when we launched, you've uh, at least, you know, 3X, 4X on the stuff you bought. You probably got free goods because um, the the rewards you've gotten back uh, in 2018 are now worth four or five times what they were. Um, so whatever you bought and got that reward back, the thing you bought is free. Um, so these stories become really easy to tell and they become really compelling to people who don't even understand the technology. And that's fine because the second kind of the second pillar of what we're trying to do is, you know, get them in, get them hooked on, get that Bitcoin reward. Now they see it, they've got you know, a, a few sats in there and they want to know what to do next. And then we want to start at this kind of educational pillar of like, all right, this is what you have. This is why it's important. Yes, it's great. You get the three X, four X return over time. But he, what we're really doing is we're converting you off the fiat system. We're weaning you off the fiat system. Um, you know, we really believe that this is going to be better for you long term. Um, so the simplest way to get you in here is you shop like you normally do. You get this, this Bitcoin back. And then we'll take it from here. We're gonna we're gonna help you ramp up on what you can do with this next and figure out where to go from here. Um, and and, a lot, and it plays out really well. The story is super easy to sell um, because you know people will come in. Uh, they'll a lot of time like a, a ton of our users. This is the first Bitcoin they've ever had, and that's um, 
it, that's awesome from for multiple reasons. From a business standpoint, it's just awesome because of the user growth. But the idea that um, these people went from zero, they got off zero through us, um, is pretty amazing. And it kind of just proves out our thesis of of why we're doing this. And um, it's a lot of fun. It's really exciting. And, and so now let's maybe dive a bit deeper into that. So I guess what what did your first iteration of the product look like? Is it a Chrome extension? Is it a you know what I mean? How does yeah. it work? <clears throat> Yeah, so we started out on uh, Chrome, and I think I had a Safari extension at the time too. Um, after a while, Apple uh, banned that type of extension in favor of some native extensions. They've actually gone back around, and we're going to release our Safari extension again here soon. But um, uh, yes, we had uh, Chrome and Safari, and you can also just shop through the site without uh, an extension. So the extension gave you the uh, extra bells and whistles of giving you the alerts and showing you when you were on a partner site uh all that good stuff so what you would do is you would install the extension and say you went to lucky brand it's one of my favorites and um the banner would just pop up it would say you know get x percent back and so you just activate your little shopping spree there uh you'd go through our little site redirect and then you're back at lucky and you can shop and your session's locked in and anything you buy in that uh trip is going to be um uh, rewarded in bitcoin so um, and then on the back end that we've connected to all these retailers. So when their order comes in and it varies per retailer, how quickly they come in, uh, which is a question we get often. So that's why I wanted to say that, but, uh, the, uh, order will come in, we will, uh, calculate the reward. We put it in your lolly wallet and then you get your notification email that it's there. And that was, that was pretty much it. That was the, that was the whole first product. Um, and then right out of the gate, uh, this kind of shows how we were a little bit short-sighted on the consumer side of things because we were trying to get these uh, normies converted into Bitcoiners. Um, we did not think at first that people would need to transfer out yet. Like we had planned on being their uh, wallet, their source wallet. Um, but people, uh, the the advanced crypto community, I guess I could say, uh, really latched onto it and like, hey, I want to transfer this off. So we had to really quickly roll out um, the ability to transfer off site. So that was kind of the next big feature to Lolly after the initial launch was adding uh, the ability to transfer uh, to other wallets as well as um, uh, offload to cash uh, through a bank. So um, yeah, those are the two big. So, so wait, rollouts. sorry, uh, that, that last thing you just said is that that's possible now. So you, you have some Bitcoin and you're like, I want the $20 mm -hmm. in cash in my bank account. I can do that. Yeah. 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 I mean, we've had that since cool. um, 2000. Okay. Yeah. The end of 2018. Yeah. It was shortly after launch. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So this is super fascinating. And then what's the, I guess, what's the journey look like since then in terms of, you know, user growth and obviously as of late, I'm sure user growth is up uh, pretty significantly, yeah. but but just in general, like, has it always been kind of up yep. to the right or were there some times where you guys were like, <laughs> no, I, I mean, you can definitely see how it coincides with the, the booms, right? So whenever Bitcoin is just booming, people are just onboarding, like it's going out of style. And um, I mean, as far as the original, pro the back end goes, I, I would say, you know, 75, 80% of the back end is still the same. Um, so we built from for scalability from the start. A lot of people say don't build to scale right away, but I mean, it was kind of in our nature. We just came out of this enterprise application. So Jared and I, um, mostly Jared, Jared's way smarter than I am, but uh, made a very scalable architecture from the beginning. And then, um, you know, yeah, as we grow, we've we've tweaked a few things here and there. Um, we've, you know, we added, uh, as we branch out into mobile, we've added um, this, a, a new backend for, um, I guess, uh, maintaining users across multiple products, multiple platforms. Um, so there's just different things you have to take into account as you add new features and new products. Wait, 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 wait Matt, can, can people cash out anywhere in the no, world? No, 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 that's US <clears> only. <throat> so, I mean, technically right now we are US right, only right, still. Right, 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 right. Um, and that's, that's for two reasons. There's a lot of regulatory issues, uh, obviously, when you go from country to country. But um, the other reason is uh, focusing on those US retailer relationships to start. Um, and a lot of our retailers still have like, you know, obviously international branches and international uh, contacts that we could reach out to and, and start implementing. But let's just take Canada for an example. As soon as we move into Canada, we want to be able to have enough Canadian retailers that will reward in Canada. Because uh, a lot of people is like, hey, come to Canada, come to Canada. It's like, yes, yes, we're, we're on it. Uh, but we want to make sure there's enough people uh, or enough retailers that can actually reward in Canada. Because a lot of times there'll be 
you know, if they're US based and they have Canadian uh, stores as well, they'll still only reward US rewards to US citizens. And it really just varies by retailer. So it's, it's actually a fairly complex problem to solve. You can't just slap new retailers on there and start giving people Bitcoin on their behalf. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, in addition to the regulatory stuff, which I would actually say the regulatory stuff is easier to, 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 to navigate because it's, it's pretty cut and dry. Uh, the, getting a good product with the right retailers um, and, and tailoring that experience to, let's say, Canadian shopper, uh, that's where the, the real challenge comes into play. And what about India? Just curious. Uh, I mean, yeah, if we'd like to, all? we don't have, uh, especially with like bank withdrawals. Bank withdrawals still currently 100% US. Um, yeah, I mean, everything's on our roadmap. That's all I can really say. Um, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're eyeballing everywhere we can go. Um, we've just got to be able to get that that good consumer experience there and um, fully understand the regulation in those different areas. Fair enough. And though, and uh, are, are you open to sharing what's next in terms of like, are, are you guys like, are you, are you guys pretty uh, hush hush about, you know, kind of future product? I mean, we are, I mean, we're moving into mobile, obviously. I think that's, I don't think that's a secret. Um, we're going to have our mobile app uh, here shortly. And then, um, you know, we do have international expansion, like I said, on our minds. Um, all of this stuff is being game planned. Um, that I, I would say those are probably the two biggest things on our roadmap. Um, uh, and then just improving the product over time. Um, we just we like to release new features now and again. We just released a new activity history uh, where you can go and see your um, your shopping history grouped by order and reward that applied to it, so on and so forth. That was kind of a long time coming. Um, <laughs> another one of those features that um, I set out to make later when we launched, uh, when people had a significant order history and it just keeps getting put off and put off and put off until um, we finally get around to doing it. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, mostly new features coming, uh, mobile and international. I would say those are the big things. And you said Lollycoin is dropping next week. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Lollycoin, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, it, it's funny. People say that a lot. It's like, when, when's the Lolly ICA? Yeah, it just um, sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, cool. Uh, but that's uh, that's really fascinating. And, and what's your guys' like, are you allowed, to, are you able to share kind of how many people are using your service? What's no, your we don't give is? that out. No. No? No, that's pretty uh, okay on I, the DL. Fair yeah, enough. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's it's significant though. It's it's actually very impressive to me. Every day I'm I'm like, oh my god, this is so amazing because just the the sheer number of people that are using it, and um, particularly the ones that are getting their first Bitcoin. I just it's a good feeling to to see something that you built being used so much. I, I, are you able to share like what the type of people are? Is it like the average 25 year old male um, that, that that kind of is the Bitcoin whatever 35 year old male uh, type of thing? Or are you starting to see other, you know, aspects we, of society being like, hey, this thing might be kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, so I, I don't have the specifics and I, I don't think I would mind sharing them if I had them, but um, the um, I would say our most vocal are probably the advanced users. Uh, and that's simply because they're using every bit of the, of the app, right? They're using everything uh, all the way up through transfers. And that's still a very tiny portion of our user base as far as like people just, you know, not your keys, not your coin. I 100% agree with that. Um, so if you want to transfer off, I'm happy to oblige. Like that's, I totally agree with that philosophy. So uh, there's no reason to trust us. You should trust yourself only. That's 100% agree. So those people are using our transfer system. Uh, the still vast majority of people, I think, are, are okay keeping it where it is. And that's also fine. Uh, because again, I mean, once one, I consider that an, adva an advanced move of like introducing them to a new wallet that they might want to have. And we've done that before. Like we have a very active Twitter community. And a lot of times people are like, okay, what do I do next? Like, how, I want to transfer this off to my own wallet. What does that look like? Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll step people through uh, how to use a hardware wallet to move their stuff off the site. It's just, it's, we have no reason to want to hold their money uh, other than for their convenience. So um, yeah, it's, it's, gosh, I would still say the vast majority of people are in that, that bucket of very new to Bitcoin. Um, and I, this kind of just proves out our thesis of, um, you know, the, the new crowd coming in uh, is, is the are, are the type of people that are using Lolly the most? That is heartwarming. I love that. I, I mean, I love the fact that you guys are doing what you're doing because 
yeah, it's just, it's so easy to just get, you know, geek out on Bitcoin and talk to, you know, the same 10 people about it, about the SHA-256 and, uh, yeah. but it's like, who cares? <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm per perfectly, I'm very accessible on Twitter. So anybody that wants to jam about any of the like uh, nitty gritty behind the scenes mm. of I'm perfectly willing to do that. And I'm also willing to just be, cheer with you when you get three extra awards over a year. I, I mean, it's, it, it's a really good feeling. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, I use it all the time. I just got more Sam's Club rewards because I'm shopping at Sam's for the holiday season. And, you know, we just added Food Line and I had already shopped at Food Line every week. Uh, that's a regional grocery store here. And um, so now I can do all my shopping on Food Line online and have it delivered in an hour. And then I get, you know, my sats back in my email. And it's, it's a good feeling. Like, it's a really good feeling to just see that pop up and not really have to do uh, anything except what you're already normally doing. And, um, I would say I'm actually most of the uh, employees are probably Lolly's biggest users because <laughs> we, we just, it, it's an exciting process. You know, we build this and we use it. We, we, we eat our own dog food and um, then we just kind of evangelize it. So you guys have been around since you said 2017 officially? We launched, we launched in August of 2018. 2018. Interesting. Interesting. And you guys have made quite a splash. I mean, I don't know. It's uh, it, uh, like, I, I know it's my first time meeting you, but it's like if I were to draw a pie chart of like all the different brands in the company that take up my mind share, Lolly's in there. You know what I mean? It's like they've, they've figured awesome. out a way to, to wedge their way <laughs> into there. And I think that's a function of doing something obviously unique um, and different, but also I think important, right? Which is just like, it's not just about doing something that's different. It's like about doing something that's going to actually make a difference. Um, but uh, so I have a question, since you are the CTO and uh, I'm just curious, are there any kind of like tech geeky technical things within the Bitcoin world that excite you? Um, I know there's a lot of stuff in the Ethereum world that's happening. And it's kind of hard to keep up sometimes, but on the Bitcoin side, it seems like, you know, they, they, they narrowly focus on usually getting, you know, big shit across the finish line, but anything that that's caught your imagination a bit? Yeah, I mean, so this, yeah, I'm sure everybody's heard of cold card at this point, but I, I think- Woo woo! Is, Sorry, yeah. I love, yeah. Rodolfo was the first guy I ever met in Bitcoin in Toronto in 2012, I think. But yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, started, I, I, um, I pulled up the like how-to for cold card and, and like, it, it's just everything is thought of, uh, you know, from how, how deep you want to go with your privacy and your randomness and, you know, your air gapping versus networking. It's just like, it's all there, whatever level you want to use in order to secure your Bitcoin is there. Now, again, um, this is specific. This is the tech geeky side because I, I think it's a it's super, I mean, I could not give, uh, someone who wasn't in the Bitcoin a cold card and say, go to this entire, get some dice out, uh, air gap your cold card and go through all this process to secure Bitcoin. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so uh, I, I think the consumer uh, facing side of stuff does appeal to me a bit more. Um, but again, like, I mean, the cold card itself, there's, there's just, um, you can do a few things or you can do a ton of things uh, depending on your, your risk level or your, um, I guess your, um, literacy in, in, into, into the Bitcoin world and the crypto world. So I, I, I just think that's really cool um, that everything was considered from, you know, soup to nuts in that, in that design. Um, yeah, that, that's probably one of the coolest. Yeah, you know, that's a Toronto project, right? Those guys are uh, I did not, down no. the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, big fan of theirs, big fan of theirs. I was going to say, I, 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 I don't know if you knew this, but okay, so the like the main kind of brains, the the guy who the CTO, I guess, of of Cold Card, uh, I, I I heard this. This might be you know I don't know one of those like legends that maybe aren't even real, but I heard that you know every time you're well once Corona's over, you, every time your plane lands in an airport. Um, there's like a terminal and there's a little screen with like that beeps. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? Like the guy that like that entire system supposedly was designed by Peter. Um, oh, really? And so, yeah, he's like his, the guy is like insanely like smart guy. And and, and the and the CoinKite, uh, which is like the name of the company behind Cold Card is actually like two guys. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not surprised. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They're, yeah. yeah. It's tough too. Making machines, a two, a two yeah. guy team making physical products like that. That's, that's, that's tough. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, it is, and and they didn't even start there. They started with uh, 
believe it or not, actual physical kiosk, like, you know, those, not kiosks, you know, those things, POSs, you know, those things that mm-hmm. people yep. check out with whatever the debit card things or whatever, yep. they had their own kind of ecosystem around that. And, and that, that was their thing for years. And then they eventually they pivoted to was that a card crypto and, and an or? open dime. It was a crypto checkout. Yeah, it was a crypto yeah. checkout, but it involved physical stores to actually go and, you know, right. buy yeah, these that... like, you know, expensive mm-hmm. clunky terminals, et cetera, et cetera. Also, yeah. Um, but yeah, but these guys have been, you know, and, and I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of respect for people attempting hardware too, because like, I'm convinced uh, that, that they for call sure. it hardware because it's hard. <laughs> Um, cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that as well. So I guess, I guess just to um, kind of finish up on the lolly story, anything else, anything else you want to share on that front? I mean, I'm a bit curious in terms of it's, I mean, if I had to guess, I'm guessing you guys probably self-funded kind of the company bootstrapped it yourselves, or did you guys, I've never heard of like a fundraise or anything like that. No, I mean, we, we've had a, a few rounds. Yeah. You had, okay. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. And uh, yeah, I guess so on the lolly front. Uh, it, yeah. I was going to ask you one more quick question tipping on twitter have you ever mm-hmm. thought of that uh, it's just like i know it's like a small like microtransaction that's what i'm asking you and like you guys are vibrant on twitter and i always felt like you know product people need to get their hands on that and and like actually deliver because it's like why the heck can't i just like send you a satoshi for retweeting me or if i love your tweet just you know pop over like 100 satoshis it's like it should be seamless and it's like 10 years 13 years in and nobody's figured it out yeah, I mean, so there was, gosh, this was what, 2019, yeah, it was last year sometime, there was an app or a, a team, like it was super popular on Twitter for a while, and I, I can't even remember the name of it, but it was, it was, I mean, it was Tippet, it was something like that, it was like Tippet or something, and it was, it was that kind of thing, and uh, we had, we looked at it, and I was like, well, can we do that, and I was like, well, yeah, technically we can do that, it's, it's not super difficult, but um, it just wasn't in our, uh, I guess, critical path for uh, improving the product. I mean, it, it is a neat thing to have. It's, it's probably not going to drive a lot of, it's more of a marketing play than anything, um, which is fine. That's not to say that's, that's pointless, um, but it would be, it would have been a neat feature, I think, to add. It's just a matter of getting to those kind of things. I think, um, I think getting to some more of those ancillary fun type um, growth experiments are in our near future, but, um, you know, we've got no real plans to add tipping to Twitter or, uh, I mean, we, we, we have had plenty of brainstorming ideas of things to do on top of Twitter. Um, you know, we just released the SATS tags for uh, Bitcoin identity. That's, um, we have a lot of plans for that. Um, Twitter might be in those plans as well. Um, there's just tons of cool stuff that we could do. Like, we're always saying, oh man, it'd be awesome if we did this or this. And then, you know, it all comes back down to um, you know, what actually drives the business and um, gets us to, well, I mean, gets us to, the billion dollar company that we want to be. And so there's the fun things you can do just for fun, but then that takes away, cause we're a small team too. Like we don't have a, a huge uh, number of engineers or anything. It's really just me, Jared and job ed on the back end, And then we've got a front engineer, Eric. And um, so it's, you know, it's a small team and we like to keep a small team because uh, we feel like we can be more productive as a small team. You get too big and then people start tripping over each other and, um, at some point, everybody is doing somebody else's work for them. I think coming from a corporate background, I always felt that way of like in a large team, there's like a couple of people doing all the work and everybody else is kind of just coasting. So we're very small team oriented. Um, the downside of that is the number of things we can actually get to versus the quality things we can put out. Uh, so there's that trade off. Yes, I totally agree. Totally. So it's like there's, you said three or four of you mostly doing mm-hmm. most yeah. of the heavy lifting. Interesting. Interesting. I love that. Yeah, I know. Me too. I think I've, I've worked for massive companies. I've worked for really small companies and in between. And I, I love like the startup feel. It's it's like just knowing that like your like what you're doing is like, you know, showing itself uh, in your product. And um, yeah, and I think it really resonates through uh, the team, too. I mean, as, re- as much as it can resonate through Slack, since we're all remote, <laughs> but, you know, everybody kind of loves pitching and doing what they can. Everybody's uh, participating in uh, you know, testing and uh, product improvement. We have an idea share channel. When somebody has a good idea, they just drop it in there. And you know, everybody gets, no matter if they're an engineer or business side or customer care, um, everybody's got a voice and gets to contribute in some way. Um, it's just when there are so many ideas, it just falls on us, the engineers to actually uh, pump them out. And so that could be uh, a little 
taxing when we have other critical features that we need to push. Do you, do you guys have, I know you're small, so, but do you guys have some sort of system in terms of like how you figure out what actually makes its way on the product? Like, I mean, you know what I mean? Like you have all these cute little ideas that pop up and customers, I'm sure, pepper you with them all the time. But like, do you have some sort of matrix or grid or something? You're like, well, you know, money or something else. I don't know that 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 you look at as is like, well, do we even go down this path? Yeah, and I think, um, and this is probably true for any startup, is is when you're, especially if you're looking for funding and stuff, you kind of you kind of have to focus on one big thing at a time, and that becomes the thing you um, really try to build your story around and build your metrics around. And there's not a lot of room. I mean, I suppose there could be, but there's not a lot of room to go off and do ancillary things. You've really got to prove, all right, this is this is why we raised this round let's go really prove out what we raised it on. Um, and either that works or it doesn't. So you've kind of really got to put your all into that one thing. So it's, there's very little question about what to, to do next because of that. Like we'll, we'll just get together ahead of time and say, this is what we're going to be doing. I mean, just like any business, like this is what we're going to be doing for Q1, Q2, Q3. Uh, this is what we need to have done before holiday season um, and before code freeze, all that good stuff. So once that's in place, there's very little room to just go and try new things and um, with a small team like ours. Uh, that's not to say that we don't. We definitely do uh, get off track sometimes and, and release um, fun little things that, I mean, often go unnoticed, I guess, but um, they make us happy because they're things that we've, we've wanted to do for a while. Or so. And it may just be you know, eliminating technical debt or something uh, that's not even visible to the consumer. So. Um, yeah, for the most part, we decide well in advance uh, what we're going to work on, what's going to be the focus for this quarter, the next two quarters, um, what what gets us to that next round of funding or to the to the billion dollar company that we want to be, whichever comes first, um, and then prove out the metrics on that. Uh, hey, so it's very, hey, it's very much. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, hey Matt, quick question for you. So, like you said, you were messing around with Ethereum a couple of years ago when you started. So you were obviously aware of the whole ICO scam, whatever thing, right? But yep. curious, like how come as a veteran entrepreneur, you didn't go that way and you were like, no, we're going to go to, you know, investors uh, accredited or whatever they may be, but like proper investors and kind of take that traditional route and not, you know, dabble in, in the ICO route. I'm just curious. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I kind of have a... <laughs> I kind of have a strict moral code. And oh man, <laughs> <laughs> that's what yeah. did it. <laughs> yeah, it kind of um, it 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 puts some opportunities out of reach for me, but um, <laughs> I, I'm a happier person because of it. Like I couldn't I couldn't fathom doing an ICO and then not coming, uh, you know, not holding up my end of that bargain. I, it just there's just no accountability there. Um, it just did not, it, the whole market for ICOs and stuff just did not feel uh, legitimate. And obviously it wasn't, um, there were plenty of illegitimate, I mean, maybe there were a couple of good ICOs, I don't know, but they were by uh, by and large, just scams. So I did not, I'm not the kind of person that can do that. Um, just not in my DNA. My mom would, mm -hmm. uh, my mom would uh, make me go pick out a switch and uh, <laughs> whip me with it. <laughs> Um, no, no, no. I, I, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. We actually, we just raised around from Tim Draper recently. Barry Silver came into our company in 2014. So definitely a big fan of working with, you know, reputable, reputable people. Um, so, okay. So let's just take maybe shift gears. So on to my third American gladiator style question, Matt. Um, so do you have any contrarian beliefs, I guess, amongst Bitcoiners? Is there one truth that you hold that most people in Bitcoin would maybe disagree with you on? Yeah, so, and this has only actually come to my attention recently, but, uh, and mostly from Twitter. So, like, I consider my, myself a, a lowercase libertarian. I'm not very dogmatic about libertarianism or anything, but I feel like a lot of Bitcoiners are really, like, hardcore like, libertarian. Um, I think the problem is a lot of them equate libertarianism with what they consider their version of freedom uh, and liberty and not what's good for all people. Um, so I kind of, I lean more toward being able to uh, use your freedom to do good for others as well, uh, which seems to be in contrast to a lot of the uh, pitchforks on Twitter. Um, I don't know if it's completely contrarian, but there, there, there seems to be this uh, idea that in order to be a libertarian, you uh, have to be uh, all about 
yourself and your freedom and, uh, you know, keeping all your money to yourself and not necessarily um, being concerned about other people's well-being. And I'm, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm very concerned with other people's well-being and, um, you know, all types of people, uh, no matter what their walks of life or their background. So, um, yeah, I would say that's that's fairly contrarian in, in that regard. I it, that's it's actually news to me. I did not realize that that was a thing, but um, I just always felt like being a libertarian meant uh, being all inclusive and wanting liberty for all people. Um, what do you mean by that? And and I ask because uh, so I had a chance to meet Dr. Ron Paul at Satoshi mm -hmm. Roundtable recently, but he he strikes me as like you know kind of the at least for me you know the source of truth, the guy I learned about money from, you know, and liberty from, and 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 the guy was a freaking like doctor, I think, delivering like four thousand babies, mm -hmm. and you know, and and when he was asked about like well who should take care of poor, he's like I think he said something along like the, the I think traditionally churches. Uh, would and, and and so I'm just getting at like what um, like what do you mean by that like uh, yeah so, like do, do you find that like libertarians don't give a shit about others uh, because I, I find that a lot of them do no well I mean that that's how I felt I felt like a lot of them did uh, and maybe I'm listening to a vocal minority on Twitter but um, which is often the case the minority is very vocal uh, on Twitter <laughs> uh, but I mean you know I don't want to get too much into um, red versus blue or Trump versus Biden or whatever but um, you know, I, uh, I, I guess I lean socially liberal, uh, more so, no, definitely. I'm hundred percent more socially liberal, I think, than most libertarians. I, I, it seems to me that the hardcore libertarians think anything that goes into the left side of the spectrum is bad. And it's, it just becomes socialism at that point. And I just don't agree with that. I think that's, mm. uh, I think you can willingly and voluntarily take care of other people and, and, and support policies that do take care of other people without, uh, you know, uh, teetering on socialism. It's just, it's just nonsense. Um, and then you get, you kind of get shit for that. Um, when you say things like that, it's, uh, it's like, oh, you're not a true libertarian. I'm like, oh, I never said I was. And that's why I go with the lower case because um, I don't know, I just, seems to me like uh, we should be willing to take care of people uh, who are less fortunate and, I, I just don't see that from a lot of people these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, my, my most recent like whenever people ask me about like religion or politics, they're like, "Oh, you know, what are you?" My, my new answer is eternally confused. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> that's the thing. I think, I think for the most part, I like to try to kind of stay somewhere in the middle and be very pragmatic about things. And um, they're, you know question whose values I share um, the most with and, you know, how that relates to policy. That's, you know, a completely different thing. And it's just like, can I, can I relate to this person? Is this person, um, does this person have the same values that I do? And, um, mm. you know, it's because uh, I'm, I'm an independent. I mean, I think, I think I have that in common with most uh, uh, Bitcoiners too. So we all register independent and don't really adhere to parties for the most part. Um, I know, and I feel like Bitcoin is supposed to be for everybody, and there's still kind of this raw. I mean, we can't have it for people on the left, and just yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I hear what you're saying. I know, I, I, you know, and that was my one of my things too. Is back in the day, like Occupy Wall Street, Ron Paul, all these things. I used to get so triggered. I used to be like so obsessed with like trying to make a difference and ah, yeah. oh, my guy didn't win. And now I felt like not so happy. And I would just be like, my happiness was a function of what would happen outside of me. Um, whereas like, as soon as Bitcoin came into my life, I was like, ah, oh, finally, like something I can focus on yeah, well, and I put mean, a little it, bit of energy into. <laughs> yeah, it's something that just kind of makes sense. And it, and it is for everybody. It's usable by everybody. Um, there, I guess people that will give it a bad name, but um, I think it's one of the first things I saw that was uh, very approachable and relatable to everybody from all walks of life. And it was supposed to be for everybody from all walks of life. And um, the idea, the gatekeepers, I guess that's what I don't like is the gatekeeping um, of like what you're supposed to be in order to be a Bitcoiner. And I think that's, mm. like, I think that's, that sums up my contrarian opinion is the, the damn gatekeepers. It's like, stop it. This is for everybody. Um, nobody has to have your thought process in order to come in and use Bitcoin, um, you know, in order to opt out of fiat money 
uh, you do not need to be an ultra right wing uh, pitchforker um, to do that. Like you don't have to be angry at the government to do that. You can do it. You can take advantage of it. Um, yes. I, I mean, I kind of feel like we're swimming around something. I, I'm a little hesitant to kind of ask you exactly what we're what we're getting at here because um, you know I, I don't want to I don't want to you know uh, take this into but but I but I, I think there's something interesting there that you're saying. I I think uh, I agree with you. I think there's I don't know my my, my thesis is that look look. I think three days after Trump came down that uh, escalator, I was like, I told my parents, I told everybody, I was like, that guy's going to be the president. Not that I like him, not that I like want him to become president, but I was just like, I've been around the United States enough to know that that man is the future president of the United States. There's enough people in this country that think exactly like him that just aren't willing to say it. He's the president and he became it. And so I, I try and look at all this with a sense of detachment a bit. Cause like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. like, it doesn't affect me. And I'm like, I live in Canada for crying out loud. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just like one big, like reality TV show gone bad. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I mean, what a year, right? It's just been. What a year. What a year. I, I, are you, are you, are you, do you have any thoughts on, on this whole, uh, the voting thing? Do you think it's, uh, is this Trump, these guys, are they really onto something or are they just barking up the wrong tree? No, no I mean, it's, I, I think it's fine. People are upset. <clears throat> People rightfully get upset when they lose something. I think it's perfectly legitimate um, to be upset about it and to do whatever you think you need to do in order to cope with that. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's, it is what it is. I, I, I don't know if anything's going to change, I highly doubt anything's going to change. It's just, um, I, I, you know, I feel, I feel worse because I'm, I'm not terribly affected by either outcome. Um, because like, it's regardless of what happens, uh, because of, of who I am, I, I don't have the problems that a lot of people have. And a lot of people are protesting for, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the different movements, the different protests are out there. I mean, it's on both sides. It's, both ends of the spectrum. There's plenty of people out there that are upset, that are hurting. Um, I'm very fortunate to have uh, a good life, a good healthy family. Um, the uh, the only thing I can do is like try to support the people that uh, don't have that as much as possible, and to, like listen to the people that are hurting and figure out you know what can I do to help these people um, not hurt anymore. And we've gotten completely off of. <laughs> Off perfect. Of, this is perfect. Uh, product it's perfect. design. It's all good. Man. But um, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the, the, yeah. well, that the thing, Bitcoin is not just like ones and zeros, right? Isn't it like philosophical as much as it is like about I don't know I, freedom and blah blah blah. I don't know. It is. I don't think it should drive philosophy though. I think mm. you should bring your philosophy to it. Like, fine if you're if you're seeing mm. the world in a new light because of Bitcoin, that's great. But um, and by the way, when you talk about gatekeepers, are you talking about core developers? No, not necessarily. Um, or just the community just, at large, like the Twitter, the Twitter heads. Yeah, like the <laughs> yeah I mean, there, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a type of uh, gatekeeper that just thinks you're supposed to fit into this particular mold to be a Bitcoiner. And it's just not, it's just not how I am. So mm, mm. I hear you, man. My, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, inter I interact with all kinds of tw people on Twitter, both sides of the spectrum. And um, it, it doesn't really bother me too much, but um, I like to be inclusive. So. Well, I like your I like your Twitter feed for whatever it's worth. I think it's uh, you know it brings a smile to my face. There's too much seriousness <laughs> uh, going it. on there, man. You you keep it light. <laughs> and with a name company name like Lolly, how can you not, right? Um, <laughs> hey, I was gonna ask you uh, just on the note of you know, uh, like wanting to help a lot of people, but using maybe free market principles or whatever, like things that aren't really like told to people to do, but people that can, things that are choice. Where am I going with this? Is Have you thought much about um, uh, UBI, universal basic income, which is like this notion that everybody should get on planet earth, I guess, or whatever in a country should get like a certain minimum amount of income. Yeah. Now, whether it comes from the government or some other source, TBD, but just generally the philosophy that humanity ensures that you know we at least have food on our table is that something that that's you know you think that's super like communist talk or do you think that that i don't know i'm gonna shut up no. what's your thought <laughs> no i mean again i don't i don't like i don't like to bucket things off into isms but um the you know it fits with my philosophy of uh, no one no one should be hurting um everyone should be taken care of particularly children 
Uh, I, one of the things that really bugs me a lot is uh, the uh, school lunch money debt problem. Um, and uh, maybe you're not aware, but uh, there's- there are I don't think I heard that. Yeah, I mean, so I don't know how it is in Canada, but kids have to pay for their lunches uh, at school in the United States. And there's a lot of kids that they accrue this lunch money debt. And you know, there's even severe cases where somebody threw food away in front of the kid because they didn't pay their lunch money or something. I mean, just really just non common sense stuff. It's like, you cannot not feed a kid. You can't do that. Um, some, some kids, it's the only meal they get. And that kind of stuff really, as a dad, that kind of stuff really, really bothers me. Um, so, I mean, from that perspective alone, I think that fits in my philosophy of taking care of others, particularly children. Um, uh, it gets a little fuzzier, I think, when you get up to the adult level. Um, again, I do want to help everybody. I don't know if UBI is the right solution. It's actually one of those interesting topics because I think um, it resonated with uh, uh, a lot of uh, Bitcoiners, even though it was kind of a a government, uh, a pro-government approach to solving people's poverty. And so you kind of see this mixed uh, bag of people. I mean, it's a complex topic, so it should have a complex response. Um, I don't have any kind of clear uh, opinion on it. Um, I would like to see some uh, strategies on how to fund it and implement it. Um, you know, if it starts with feeding kids first, that's that's probably fine with me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the what the future looks like. I think I think in the perfect world where we have free energy uh, and then essentially equates to free resources for everything, then everybody could be uh, uh, fed and well taken care of without issue. Uh, I think the reality is that you've got limited resources um, and those need to be shared somehow uh, across people. And right now it's uh, supposedly a meritocracy, I, I guess you could say of or, uh, you know, the harder you work, this is supposed to be the idea. I'm not saying this is the way it is. This is supposed to be the idea that uh, the harder you work, the uh, the share of resources you get. Um, I don't know. It, it's super complex. I don't have an answer. Uh, I'm just a, I'm, I'm just a CTO at a, <laughs> at a Bitcoin rewards company. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. okay. I was going to ask you, um, so have you thought much about AI? Or like, do you think much about it? Or do you read much about it? Is it something, or are you just like, ah, buzzword? <laughs> no, I, I really like it. I haven't had much time to like stay up to date on the latest AI or anything. I love the idea of, uh, I love the concept. Like, I mean, a su huge sci-fi geek. Um, mm. I, I just love anything that's super futuristic. Um, most of the AI you s still see to this day is not terribly, um, compelling is at least in the form of like human AI, you know, you've got your machine learning and things. And uh, there are a few unique projects out there that uh, uh, kind of try to take on the challenges of making a human like AI. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I it's, it, I'm kind of in the Elon Musk uh, uh, bucket there of it's inevitable if you make the right AI that it will just enslave us all. So <laughs> like, I mean, Logical conclusion, if you make a, uh, a computer that can think like a human, but do so at, you know, a billion times the speed, how much faster and how much smarter it's going to be than, than humans um, in a short amount of time. So, uh, yeah, Skynet. I fear Skynet. Um, and, and, you know, that, 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 like when I was a kid, I remember watching Terminator and it was just like, that's so far off. That'll never yeah. happen. Um I, I drive a Tesla and the thing freaking drives itself, dude. Yeah. The thing yeah. actually, it's not like theory, not someday. Yeah. I just click a button and it yeah, drives itself. Stuff. And it's That's, actually it, it, safer than when I'm driving myself. Sure. Like yeah. I actually feel like it tracks that middle line better than I can. So even like general AI, let's say that never comes. Like these narrow bands of AI could easily replace millions of jobs. And I yeah. do wonder what happens in that world where, you know what I mean? Like Uber drivers are out now because every car yeah. drives itself. And, and, and I hate to sound like a Luddite or a communist, uh, but at the same time, it's like these types of issues are coming. And it's like, how does humanity, you know, address them? And I don't, I don't, think, I don't think some ism is the solution. Um, I actually, I don't know. I sometimes wonder though, I wonder if maybe the, the, the space that we're in, like if Bitcoin and blockchain can address some of these major concerns, because like, look, like 
like AI feeds off of data and all that data sits in like the walls of what, two governments and five companies? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of scary. Yeah, and I, I, mean, I think to some degree, I think, you know, every, every new generation comes with new technologies, new jobs are created, um, new skills are required for those jobs. I think the problem is how quickly and how rapidly things ch are changing now. So you don't have a lot of time uh, to be retrained to do a new job to support that new technology necessarily. So I think that's the problem that needs to be solved more than anything uh, as far as like maintaining jobs is the ability to um, educate people and train people uh, as new stuff comes out to be uh, relevant to either supporting that AI or supporting the industries around that AI. So um, I, I think it all boils down to education at some point um, at, at, the, at the smallest level of how do you how do you make a society that is uh, has no normies, uh, as you might call it? Like right now, the, you, we've got uh, there's like the internet generation, and they're 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 growing up with a completely digital world, uh, my kids included. So it's like, what does what does their future look like? Are they solving this problem simply from the fact that they're living in a world that's always connected and always online? Everything's on demand. Um, there are these things they're going to be accustomed to and like context switching like this, like this, like this. So are they being trained just unwittingly, unknowingly to be able to uh, change industries, change jobs, learn new skills on the fly uh, as this stuff comes out? And then and then look at, you know, what their kids are going to do. It's going to be even uh, more rapid pace when those kids are born. And I, I think giving uh, getting these opportunities and education to uh, these younger generations uh, as they grow up with this, these connected worlds. I, I think, I, I like to hope that the problem kind of works itself out because of the way uh, they'll be raised. Uh, I think there needs to be a higher concentration on uh, the education, the actual quality education of these, these kids as they grow up in these worlds so that they can actually, so they can adapt intellectually uh, because it's not, it's not about adapting you know, into a physical world anymore. It's about adapting into a, a digital world. Everything's connected, everything's online. Um, yeah, it's, it's just context switching all the time. And that's going to be jobs. It's going to be context switching and jobs. Are you guys doing the whole homeschooling thing now throughout this whole pandemic? No, so they actually, uh, we did for like the whole first period there, um, just like through March through August. And then their school actually went back into session. So they're, they're uh, at physical school. And uh, so far, so good. Uh, no cases. And I um, hope it stays that way because boy, uh, having kids at home all the time while you try to work. Cause I work at home. I mean, I was working at home anyway. And then now I was working at home with kids at home all the time. Matt, you said you're in New York or California? No, or? I'm in Durham, North Carolina. North Carolina. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So I guess maybe just, uh, you know, just to kind of like round it all out. Um, w were there any questions that you wish I'd asked that I never asked? <laughs> Oh, I know wow. I, we covered um, a lot of ground, but I usually no, like to I, end up with that one just because I don't know, maybe there's something on your mind or something going on that you're like, we didn't talk about this. No, um, no, we actually went pretty deep. I yeah. Think, uh, questions that uh, I wasn't, I wasn't quite expecting to go that deep. Um, that's cool though. I, I mean, I, I like jamming about philosophy, I suppose. Um, I don't normally like uh, forcing my philosophy on people, but when I'm asked, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Um, what have we talked about? We haven't really talked about uh, uh, how exciting this price is, though. Uh, how how, ah, it, uh, how normal it feels. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my, my saying is the price is the least exciting thing about Bitcoin. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, we I all, we all like a, say that. We I know, all I know. Say that. Wink, wink, then, nudge, nudge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, um, it's just, it's so cool to see it, though, I think. Uh, you know, having been there in 2017 and then having it come back around again, it just kind of shows kind of the cyclic, cyclic nature and what it could do in the future, I think. Um, but since you brought up price, make some predictions for us here. Let's go. Oh my God, that I don't- But you I brought it up, really dude. I wasn't gonna right. go there. <laughs> okay, then I'm gonna say uh, 22 by year's end. Okay, but no, but like, uh, where does this, this, this one peak, this, this, whatever we're on, this run, like where, where does it peak before the next big, crash you 22. know I, I say 22 22 by years in then a pullback um we'll say, let's say it pulls back to 14 i want to be very specific yeah 22 by the end of the year pulls back to 14 and then the next bounce up will take a couple of years but it'll be uh it'll be significant 
That's that's my prediction. I, I, I base it on absolutely nothing except for I guess Bayes theorem. So we'll um, we'll see what happens. But remind me I'm, about Bayes theorem. I feel like I learned that in engineering school, but I forget. It's a good probability, right? Something relative, something to do with yes. probability. Yeah. Yeah, relative yeah, yeah, probabilities yeah. based on past probabilities. So okay, yeah, I like that. That sounds that sounds that sounds smart to me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of, I, I look at uh, the Bitcoin price as like trying to predict uh, the, wait, no, what am I trying to say here? Um, I, the, I find that trying to predict short-term price of Bitcoin is like trying to predict the position of an atom inside of a glass of water. Yeah. It's almost I impossible. Mean, like yeah, I find it so difficult. Like, and every time I try and time it, the market does exactly the opposite of it. So I have like this philosophy now where I, Anyways, but no, no. Um, so I think it's I, I think it's really hard to predict short term uh, prices, sure. but I do think long term prices are more like trying to predict the temperature of a glass of water. Meaning you can predict the aggregate, you know, of the actions of all the atoms in the water, but it's very difficult to nail down any you know particular atom. So I think that I don't know. I, I, I um, so my, my prediction is. Uh, I, I bought my first Bitcoin at ten dollars. So I've been so it's, I've seen this pattern play out now many times. Which is, uh, I'll just say what I think it's going to happen. I think I think we're going to shoot past the the, net, the last high of twenty k, and we're going to start marching towards ten x, which is two hundred to two hundred fifty k. And uh, and yes, I agree with you. And I don't think it'll happen by end of the year. I think this is like the next two or three years. And then and then at one point, whether it takes six months or two or three years, I don't know. But once it hits that 200, 250K mark, we're going to see something, something happen. Regulatory exchanges crashing, oh, yeah. something price of Bitcoin charge uh, fees going up way too, something happening that then just cuts its knees off. Bitcoin will crash to 30k or 25k at the last high and remain there for four or five years and people will call it a failure and be like look told you not to get in at 250 told you now you lost all that money and then we'll just and then builders like you and i will continue building for years and years and years and then the the ecosystem will be ready for that million dollar bitcoin price and then it'll be another catastrophic crash to 200 or 250 and it'll remain there people will call it another failure and they'll just keep doing this. I, I think, because I, I think it's well, a function of human human nature. I mean, every time it goes down, it's a failure, right? Yeah, that, <laughs> that's and we hear it every day. It's like, oh, Bitcoin <laughs> crashed. It crashed five hundred dollars. Okay. Yeah, it's like seriously, buddy. <laughs> like that's an opportunity. Yeah, to buy I don't understand more. how people can do the the trading. I mean, they got to be smarter than I am. To, I, to... I had some buddies recently that were just like, oh my God, I turned, you know, half a Bitcoin into 60 or something. It's like futures trading and this and that. I tried it. Ah, uh, man, it's, no, it's, it's too hard, man. Me. I'm not a trader. It's not for me. Like I like <laughs> building trading platforms, but not. Yeah, yeah you were saying? No, I was just saying it's not for me. It, it, it's, I mean, I've got a family. There's only so much risk I can take. So it's, it's yeah, scary, there's... man. I don't do roller coasters for the same reason, you know? It's really? Like, I love roller coasters. Oh, God. Oh, my, my wife loves them, but I'm just like, why would I put my physical life in jeopardy for no upside whatsoever? Well, I think that way about bungee jumping. <laughs> I, I won't, what? I won't, I won't do that for bungee jumping. Um, so how is that, it different? I mean, it's I'm suicide on wheels, dude. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> I can see that, I suppose. I, I just see that bungee cord breaking. Like I, I, I fully buy into this sing technological singularity notion that I'm going to live forever. And I'm not going to play with like the notion that I might just accidentally fall off a freaking building, sunny death because of, of a roller coaster ride. Dude, I, that, I'm not going that way. No way. Hell no. So I don't what you're care. saying is I'm not, I'm not going to see you jump out of a plane in a wingsuit anytime soon then. Fuck no. Why? <laughs> Impossible. Impossible. I was, I was actually thinking of getting my pilot's license and then I heard about Kobe and shit. I was like, ah, forget it. Like there's no the ground is fine. I'm, I'm happy with ground. I'll, I'll let guys like Elon work on, you know, like the, the, the spaceship to Mars. And then once it's super safe. Although some of the jetpacks are really cool that I've seen. I'd be down. Actually, uh, uh, Adam Draper, one of our investors, he's like, 
huge into jetpacks. He even had a freaking guy come into the parking lot one day and like demonstrate his Iron Man suit. It's crazy. <laughs> Is that the one that it takes like all your upper body strength because it's coming out of your hands or whatever? Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Something like that. I actually spent eight years in robotics. My, my wife's a mechatronics oh, wow. engineer and I've That's been awesome. in every like major robotics lab in the world practically. And that was my thing before, before yeah, 2011, 12, I got into Bitcoin. But hey, hey Matt, you know, I don't want to make this one about me. I want to ask you, um, um, it, just in closing, I guess, like, you know, people, where do people learn more about you? Where do people, like your website, if they want to follow you as a human, <laughs> where yeah. do they go? So Lolly's at lolli.com. It's pretty simple, like a lollipop. Uh, and then uh, I'm Matt Center on uh, Twitter. That's Center with an S, uh, commonly misspelled because it's obviously another an E-R, right? E-R. E-R, M-E-T-T-S-E-N-T-E-R. So come follow me on Twitter. I'm happy to engage uh, as long as you're nice. <laughs> uh, we like to keep it positive on my feed. So um, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, Matt, really, really appreciate you spending this time uh, with me. I, I know it was a bit of a gamble because we didn't know each other. Uh, but yeah, I, this has been super fun. I am so excited that we got to meet. This has been uh, delightful. So maybe with that one, uh, yeah, I can, we can bring it to an end. And sure. all right. Great. Thanks for having me.